Uh, welcome to the Arsenic Theory channel. Today I'll be reading along with you uh, The Next Million Years by Charles Gal Galton Darwin. And the chapter I'm reading today is uh, 7 called Man a Wild Animal. I've been asked a lot lately, I've been sent many questions as to why am I recommending, why am I reading this book? Um, I think it's one of the most organic responses I had received or, you know, understandings I had received uh, from the book uh, to address uh, conspiracy theories. Uh, although they, they are addressed indirectly, he doesn't, you know, actually go into them at all. But he gives me a lot of understanding about human nature and the social interaction that takes place. And that indirectly answers, gives me a lot of answers to the conspiracy theories that are so prevalent nowadays, uh, especially with the advent of internet. But uh, let's continue reading. Chapter 7, Man, a Wild Animal. In the past two chapters, I have examined different aspects of the nature of man. In the first, he was regarded just like any other species of wild animal, while in the second, some of his social qualities were considered, which might not be regarded as those of a wild animal. Civilization might, loosely speaking, be counted as a sort of domestication, in that it imposes on man conditions not at all typical of wildlife. Uh, the question about civilization is an interesting one. Uh, not everyone regards it as a sort of, you know, the final destination of the human society for, you know, as, uh, for heaven, for building heaven on earth. Uh, many look at civilization as an artificial const construct that is designed to manage and control you, or you know, control and manage you, I should say. And uh, it is so true because if you look at any philosophers of the past, uh, starting from Plato and Aristotle and ending with Schopenhauer and Immanuel Kant, you will notice that all of them at some point in their career, in their you know, philosophical career, speak about the management of the human populations, of the humankind on some level, whether it's economic level or you know political level as Karl Marx, or from the labor perspective of, uh, you know, labor economic perspective of Plato. But all of them do discuss this, uh, you know, super important aspect of society is how to control and manage the population. Because we do live in a society as a human beings, and we do interact with each other. Um, and these interactions, um, in order for these interactions to be as profitable, as efficient, as productive to the society, all sorts of constructs are created. And that's what civilization is. It's an artificial construct in which you are born. And for, for most of your time, you have really no say as far as what type of design and what description it forms. It might then at least be argued that it is a false analogy to compare man to a wild animal, but that he should rather be compared to one which has been domesticated. I shall maintain that this analogy would be false, and that man is and will always continue to be essentially a wild and not a tame animal. So in this chapter, Charles Galton Darwin looks at examines and examines whether man or you know human being is a wild or a tamed animal has he been tamed by civilization or does he remain wild before coming to this main theme it is important to notice that if it were admissible to regard man as a domesticated animal the whole time scale of history would have to be radically altered Thus, though the geological evidence shows that it takes a million years to make a new wild species, we know that the various domesticated animals have been created in a very much shorter time. In the first place, it is necessary to be clear as to what is it meant by a wild or a tame animal. 
we are apt sometimes to call an animal wild because it is dangerous to man and to call it tame because it is harmless, but this is a slovenly way of speaking. And here I shall use the word tame simply as a synonym for domesticated, which I think it is true meaning. The difference between a wild and a tame animal, as Galton sees it, is uh, rests on a premise of domestication. And he compares it to the animal kingdom um, as far as you know other domesticated animals are concerned. Can a man be also considered as a domesticated or a tamed animal? Or whether he remains wild. A tame animal then is one that does the will of a master and a savage watchdog trained to bite all intruders is tamer than a friendly terrier which sometimes slips away to do its own private hunting. A chief feature in domesticated animals has been the creation of a great variety of breeds, each specialized for some particular purpose either practical or aesthetic. If man is really a tame animal, there is no reason why breeds of man should not be created, say breeds of mathematicians or of professional runners, who should possess gifts far beyond anything we know now, and far beyond anything that their fellows could compete against. Certainly, at the present time, mankind is very far from this. But to see this clearly, it is best to return to the prime feature of tameness, obedience to a master. One thing I wanted to emphasize is that he is going to examine uh, in this chapter uh, what he calls a prime feature of tameness, obedience to a master. Uh, in many authoritarian and collectivist states, obedience to a master is a must. Um, the ruler has a sacred, a sacred quality to him or her, and uh, when and all the people must blindly obey that leader, and we see that in today's, uh, you know, authoritarian regimes, whether they are in Eastern Europe, whether they are on an African continent, on um, in the South America, we see that the ruler has. A sort of uh, it's sort of treated like a god and they must be obeyed without any question so is it indicative um, that the populations of these authoritarian regimes are tamed or domesticated well that's something that Charles Galton Darwin looks like that in, in, in this chapter whether even in these societies people can be considered tamed or domesticated I would say that uh, more collectivist societies certainly have people who might be considered tamed, uh, especially the Chinese and um, Asian societies, um, Indian societies as well. And the reason I say that is because their individual is not really worth much. The collective, the society as a whole has value, but individual means nothing. Individual has no value. Um, of course, comparing to the Western societies where individual is gold and, uh, you know, all the institutions, all the rules are based around individual value. It is obvious that we in this country, with our passion for freedom, value wildness very highly. Of course, he's talking about the United States. Whereas in some lands where the population are content to live under a much more strictly controlled rule of discipline, tameness may be more nearly acceptable. So he looks at tameness uh, around the world um, like a, on, uh, he looks at it on a scale. So some populations are more tame than others. For instance, Western are less tame, they're more wild. And the Eastern societies are more tame than less wild. I'm going to maintain that this cannot happen and that man is untamable. From the historical perspective, a man really is not tameable at all. That's why we do. That's why we do see dynasties that last for three hundred years or more, and then they eventually get collapse or get overthrown or get wiped out by other uh, uh, other races or nations around them. 
um, most of the time the dynasties uh, have uh, end up in internal strife where brothers or sisters fight against each other until a stronger or more cunning uh, person arises and takes over uh, uh, takes over the tribe. Although the possibility of the brave new world described by Aldous Huxley seems to be possible and at times inevitable, I still have this hope that uh, uh, Winston Smith of the 1984 novel by George Orwell said when he was being tortured by uh, O'Brien and uh, he, Winston said, you know, we will, uh, you will be defeated. And O'Brien said, well, what will defeat us? He said, life will defeat you. And although I know that O'Brien says that we control life, at the same time, I think this life, which uh, could be described as being a wild animal, is something that cannot be tamed. If you do tame it, then you're no longer human, you're something else. And as Galton will expand later in this chapter, a man, a wild animal, cannot be tamed. So this gives me a lot of hope, but also gives me a lot of understanding of why you know, human beings are not in this uh, controlled, con uh, rigorously controlled state in a society, that we are free, that we do have ability to choose uh, how to lead, what to believe, what to value in our lives. And as a result of these philosophies of the past, uh, a new body of priests called scientists arose. And one of their first orders, their first holy experiments, was called eugenics, or a betterment of humankind through selective breeding, where they thought that it was possible, would be possible to achieve a perfect human being through selective breeding and of course it received a very bad rap during world war ii when adolf hitler came into power and utilized it to the extreme after that of course it didn't disappear from the human scene it just simply acquired a new name called uh, um, uh, bio uh, bioethics um, of which actually one of the brothers of uh, Rahm Emanuel, the former mayor of Chicago, is uh, he's actually a bioethicist. Bio so was Paul Ehrlich and pretty much every modern scientist who has any kind of regard in a scientific community. What is a perfect human being? I think an average person, when they think of a perfect human being, they think of a person who is happy most of their most of the time who rarely makes mistakes who is content uh, with what he has and who is uh, probably lucrative in his endeavors from the scientific and from the political perspective from the economic perspectives a perfect human being is an efficient and productive economic unit in a society as a non-tamed and a wild human being, I detest that. I do not want to be an efficient economic unit. That's not what defines me. However, the upper classes of societies have been uh, striving to achieve that for thousands and thousands of years, at least for the time of the recorded history. Thus, advertently, and inadvertently, a whole bunch of people were bred who are more tame than others, who do have this low threshold or middle threshold for susceptibility to propaganda and to different uh, fashions, to fads, and to other into other uh, trends in the society. Pretty much everyone that follows some kind of trend is either an opportunist or a tamed or, or a tamed beast following the alpha male behind them. And alphas, which I actually don't like that word, but you know, alphas or the leaders in a the society, they're the ones who create 
of these different trends. They are the trendsetters. And unfortunately, a big chunk of the population has been tamed enough or has a low threshold uh, for propaganda that follows, and then they follow them. And then the rest have to join. They pretty much have no choice. They're compulsed to do that because they still want to be part of a society regardless of how wild they are. Unless you like, you know, uh, 5 or 10% of the completely untamed bees that, you know, you do not follow anything at all and you can uh, set your own agenda for the day and for your life. But these are few far in between. Most of the people will follow, I would say like 75% will follow wherever the new trend is. One of the things I'm not going to uh, include uh, in this video the whole fable that he talks about of creating this perfect society, but I really want to read this last paragraph of this fable. He had, so he talks about a director, this benevolent dictator of sorts, who created this perfect society on the island with actresses, um, with you know lawyers, with all these different people occupying these professions to create the society. And he, he here is how he concludes. So the director comes to the end of his life, which <laughs> he lived for ten thousand years, which I guess you know could be possible with the modern, um, you know, uh, uh, with the modern improvements in society. But he had tamed men into being domestic animals, but he could not tame anyone into being a director because a director must be a wild and not a tame animal. Super important point. This is one of the points that shattered so many different conspiracy theories for me, is that let's say there is a body of man or whatever, of some kind of alien beings out there who control our thoughts, control our society, well, how are they going to ensure the continuity of their agenda if their next generation, um, if, if the next generation of people around them are either tamed or do not side, do not align to their agenda? Well, they're going to be simply overthrown or their agenda will, uh, will be so much different from this from 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 their benevolent agenda that they set up in the first place that the continuation of conspiracy uh, of the worldwide conspiracy is an impossibility and it, of course it also gives me hope uh, that i as a human being will be able to create an agenda and a life for myself as what i want and not what somebody else dictates to me um, it also parallels with what I was reading recently about the Russian history with Chengiz Khan. So Chengiz Khan uh, appeared uh, on a Mongolian scene, uh, united the entire Mongolia and all their tribes, conquered parts of China, then went and conquered uh, Eastern Europe. Um, and what's interesting, after his death, his sons and grandsons were engaged in internal strifes, strife for, you know, the next 200 years after their father's death. They were able, of course, to build and reunify three parts of the world, but they were not able to have this union, this preservation of union that Chengiz Khan, the original ruler of the Mongolian Empire, was able to build and create. This tells me that any form of sustainable rulership, any form of sustainable world order, a new world order, any sustainable conspiracy is impossible. That gives me a lot of hope. And that shattered a lot of conspiracy theories for me. Pick any ruling dynasty or a family of European or other descents, and you will notice that none of them do survive forever and ever. All of them eventually get overthrown, uh, beheaded, or whatever, at some point in time. Even after 500 to 1000 year rule, they will still get overthrown by some other dynasty, some other people that spring up. Because any kind of dynasty, as I will you know, show you in other books that I will be reading here on this channel, uh, degenerates. And we see it also in other families, just in our... 
uh, from our friends and you know fam and friends of our families is that no matter how hard the parents try their son and daughter will will you know not always grow up to what they want them to be um, and I'm talking about in terms of profession etc um, the offspring of many well-known people successful people grow up to be lazy bums and their parents can do nothing about it that's also another indication that any sustainable conspiracy cannot exist there could be of course there are conspiracies but they're usually short-lived in the long-term conspiracy requires a lot of involvement from a lot of people and also strict rulership that lasts for generations but which will eventually come to an end anyway the world is more chaotic than it seems it's more unpredictable than it seems why because on the bottom of it we have a human a man who is a wild being and has not been tamed even after thousands of years of attempts to do that from the egyptian pharaohs with their perfectly installed systems of slavery to the modern day economic and financial slavery that we exist in right now a man is essentially a wild animal still this point is so important that before following it to its conclusion i will give another example which has the advantage of not being fabulous in their studies of how to improve the human race the eugenicists have very naturally considered both ends of their problem the increase in the good qualities of humanity and the elimination of the bad qualities their chief effort has gone quite rightly at first into the easy part of the problem and they have spent most of their energy in pointing out the disastrous tendencies of the present policy of directly encouraging the breeding of the feeble-minded this restraint of the breeding of the feeble-minded is important and it must never be neglected but it cannot be regarded as a really effective way of improving the human race if by analogy one wished to improve the breed of racehorses one might accomplish a little by always slaughtering the horse that finished last in every race but it would be a much slower process than the actual one of sending the winner to the stud farm of course eugenics is a touchy subject and which has escaped unfortunately the public discourse the public platform altogether quietly the scientists do talk about it in terms of bioethics and what we see in a society is actually acceptance and integration of many different types of human beings into the society at least in the united states the rest of the world doesn't obviously see it this way and america is bombing the hell out of them in order for them to see it this way uh, but there is uh you know a different move altogether in in the western societies which we won't see the results of it because i don't know if it's good or bad to be honest with you in 100 years maybe 50 to 100 years we will actually see the results of this integration of many different kinds of breeds if you will of human beings in a society now conscious of this criticism eugenicists have often attempted to define what are the good characteristics which should be positively encouraged instead of only the negative ones that must be discouraged but the results are disappointing I wonder what would actually happen if eugenicists succeed and do breed in the qualities such as good health, good physique, high intelligence, good fam family history, etc. Although all these characteristics are completely subjective and any person uh, will not be able to assess them in any kind of balanced manner. But what would really happen? I would think it, they would create such a you know i don't know maybe superman race which would eventually exterminate each other anyway i think that's what will happen because this the resources are still limited the land is still limited and when you have all these powerful men and women running around they will eventually clash and kill each other off 
and I'm sure there'll be certain people that become exiled and you know go away from the metropolis into the hinterland and develop their own races of human beings which will um, uh, return humanity to its original state how for example is a man to weigh his own good health or good ability against the heredity made dubious say by an uncle who was insane or again how is he to strike a balance between considerable artistic gifts as he thinks, together with a good family record, but quite bad health. It is clearly beyond anyone to decide this, these things for himself. And even the matter is only half settled, since similar judgments are needed for both partners to the marriage. And of course, as rightfully as Galton, Charles Galton Darwin points out, is that pretty much most of the human beings will tend to think of themselves as either highly bred or good or acceptable in a society. They're not going to think of themselves that they are worthless and they should be exterminated or not allowed to breed. I mean, that would be unheard of. I mean, of course, you, you might have some masochists who will enjoy uh, being humiliated, etc., and, th and tend to think of themselves as worthless pieces of crap. But I would tend to think that, you know, majority of human beings tend to think of themselves as worthy to live on this earth. So I think it, it would be impossible for eugenicists, and it would be impossible for eugenicists to convince them otherwise. So this eugenics by default, by definition, is just not... Um, cannot be implemented in a society, at least in a long term. The only imaginable way of overcoming these difficulties would be to set up a class of consultants who would prescribe both marriages were eugenically admissible and how large the consequent families should be. Actually, come to think of it, eugenics was attempted to be implemented also in the United States in the 1930s. I can actually look it up on Wikipedia. There was a compulsory sterilization in America, and there were court cases uh, hearing out different cases of not allowing certain beings, such as feeble-minded or people with psychological issues, to have children. And this type of resolutions uh, were short-lived. But this does not solve the difficulty. If it only pushes it back a stage, for it leaves unanswered the question who are to be the consultants and what principles are to guide them in settling the values of the different qualities of mankind. And at the, and at the end of the day, who is the ultimate decider of what is good characteristics and bad in having an, an objective assessment of each human being based upon merit? Who is that ultimate judge? It comes back to just the difficulty I described in my fable that a tame animal must have a master and that therefore, though it might conceivably be possible to tame the majority of mankind, this could only be done by leaving untamed a minority of the population. Moreover, this minority would have to be the group possessing the most superior qualities of all. Uh, it is reminiscent to the Brave New World scenario outlined by Aldous Huxley. And I know I keep referring to that book, but it's super important. I think maybe, you know, uh, even this author here draws a lot of analogies, and uh, especially in the fable that he is describing. Because in a Brave New World, Aldous Huxley talks about alphas and betas and how alphas um, the managers of the of the you know future society is completely untamed. They actually do not receive any dosages of alcohol or any kind of solution during the time when they are being uh, grown in the in, in in the laboratory fields. You know before they are born, they actually are given the best solution, the best liquid solution in which the embryo grows up in which the embryo develops in order for them to have the most untamed characteristics because any manager any ruler must be a, a wild animal and by definition a wild animal goes against uh, an authoritarian if you will regime that eugenicists want to set up 
This example suggests the impossibility of taming mankind as a whole. But before accepting the principle fully, it is proper to examine a case where the exact contrary has happened. This is in the insect civilizations of the ants or termites. <laughs> well, that doesn't, you see, that's again shouldn't even concern us. You know, who cares if it happens in some kind of insect uh, civilizations? We are not insects, we are human beings who are very, who are conscious, who have values, who have desires. Who have aspirations so as mankind as a whole it is impossible is impossible of being tamed so that's a lot of hope for me why cannot man set up a community like an ant's nest this would be the ideal of the anarchist and Hyderto is that is it has held no promise at all of success but with the help of recent and probable future biological discoveries, some sort of imitation by man of the ant's nest cannot be quite excluded from consideration. Thus the control of the numbers of the two sexes may become possible, and with the knowledge of the various sexual hormones it might also become possible to free the majority of mankind from the urgency of sexual impulse so that they could live contented, contented celibate lives instead of the unsatisfied celibate lives that are the compulsory lot of such a large fraction of the present population of the world. If these discoveries should be made, and this is really by no means impossible, man would be able to carry out the sex revolution, which is the typical characteristic of the insect civilizations. The detail would have course would of course have to be quite different, for instead of one queen there might have to be large numbers of fertile women to renew the population, whereas there might be one king, literally the father of his own country. Also it is probable that on account of their greater physical strength, it would be the men who would be the workers. It's interesting how he describes the new the, the scientific uh, discoveries or biological discoveries, as he calls them, that would actually uh, enable a whole class of people to reduce their sexual desire and be celibate, um, satisfied celib and live satisfied celibate lives through some kind of hormonal therapy. And it is possible to create a, some sort of ants nest uh, among human beings, but there'll still be hinterlands of where wild, untamed men would run around. And even in a brave new world, there were still Indian reservations which had these untamed people who were actually born out of mother and a father, as opposed to through a budding process in a laboratory. And they were repugnant to the people who would come from this civilized world of the brave new world scenario who have unheard of of things such as mother and father i mean i can even see now it would be could be a possibility of creating at least you know 35 percent of society who would live in this animal kingdom with three different genders there is man a woman and some kind of neutral gender which will have no sexual desire at all and who would be just working, just a worker bee or a worker ant with a neutral or no sex or no gender. Such an organization is certainly repellently unattractive to most of us, perhaps excepting some of the autocrats of the present world, but it is not this that excludes the possibility of it. There is no danger whatever of its happening because of the inherent difference between vertebrate and insect. For the vertebrate is so very much more flexible than the insect in its behavior. So even this anthill of the human beings would become a possibility. It will, take, it will still take millions of years in order to create a new species that will be completely domesticated for the new society. There is no prospect of man's nature imitating an insect, but it is much more nearly imaginable that his development should go. 
like that of the dogs, into a set of breeds, each specialized for a particular purpose. So then he goes into looking at actual examples from the human history of even if certain group had splintered off and were performing selective breeding and you know all these pre eugenics uh, attempts to create desirable human beings by selective breeding, they still go back, they still return to the general population after several attempts of selective breeding, after, after generations of attempts of selective breeding. A first example may be drawn from the sanctity of the royal blood, which has been a prevalent idea in many countries, and which would give opportunity for inbreeding that is essential for the production of specialized breed. The most extreme case is that of the dynasty. And of course, I'm not going to recite all this um, degenerative characteristics that people acquired after close inbreeding of the royal families of Britain and France. They are well known. But what I will say is that they were all unsuccessful at the end. After several generations, these dynasties collapsed, went away, and got reabsorbed by the general population. Therefore, even, even if their fathers and forefathers had some sort of agenda, their children were not able to carry it through, and it died off with them. Neither in this extreme case nor in other more modern ones is there any sign of a tendency for a breed to arise that is specialized for kingship. A most striking a most striking example is the caste of the Brahmins in India, because its purity has been preserved over many centuries by the religious sanctions of their creed. They have the advantage of being much more numerous than the castes I have cited hitherto, and they have very certainly played a conspicuous part in the history of India. But they show none of the tendency to an increase in specialization that should characterize the creation of a breed. Since they were never a military caste, it is not surprising that many of the reigning houses of India are not Brahmins. And the priestly function of the Brahmin would more naturally destine him to play the part of philosopher or intellectual. There may be those who will regret that man will not attain these pinnacles of specialization, but the failure is inevitable. In order to create such specialist breeds, there would have to be a master breed at the summit, and this would be a totally different kind of thing from all the other breeds, because it would have to create itself. Charles Galton Darwin looks at two different races of human uh, kind. There is the Brahmins of India and the Jews of the Middle East. And he concludes that even they have not achieved the specialization that uh, humans were able to do to, let's say, animals during animal husbandry or in a specialization of breeding of dogs. So what his conclusion is, is that humans, even after centuries of inbreeding, cannot achieve the domestication that the animals have achieved um, when they were bred for specialized purpose by, by human beings. At every turn, the argument leads back to these questions of the master breed. Nothing can be done in the way of changing man from a wild into, into a tame animal without first creating such a breed. Of course, a conspiracy theory is called that there is some kind of master breed that is guiding us, that is creating a world agenda for everyone to follow and they condition the rest of the population to become a cog in that machine. Um, and of course, it would be impossible to do because this race of human beings that had splintered off into a separate development, if you will, would have to have created themselves. They would have been, have to be creators uh, of themselves in order for them to remain, uh, remain uh, this super master race. So it, 
it, it is quite an impossibility. One would collect together, say, a hundred of the most important present rulers. Among them, of course, should be included a good many who exert secret influence without holding any overt office, and tell them to get on with the business of settling what the master breed should be. It is impossible to believe that any such body of men would ever reach agreement on any subject whatever, so this plan fails. Even uh, from the days of old, um, dynasties that practiced heavy inbreeding would occasionally introduce somebody from the lower echelons, from the lower stratus of society, in order to dilute the blood, so to speak. So they would not actually degenerate themselves out of existence by uh, such close inbreeding. So even if we take uh, rulers or very bright individuals of today's day and have them all placed in the same city or in the same village and uh, encourage them to procreate and have children, it does not mean that they will, after you know generations or even uh, centuries of inbreeding, would uh, uh, breed into this master race that will rule the world and become the most brightest and and become the brightest and most capable individuals. The, genera de the degeneration will ensue and they would have to bring in some new blood in order to dilute this degenerative um, d this degenerative trends that will take place within them. Even if one uh, takes, uh, you know, Freemasonic writings, uh, where, uh, let's say, Manly P. Hall or Al Albert Pike frequently talk about the benevolent dictator and the prince that they're looking for to fill in the shoes of this philosopher king idea. But it is almost impossible to find this philosopher king, because even if you have one and you groom them to become the leader of the world, uh, they will be toppled eventually, and whatever system they're able to build, let's say they are quite capable person, it will be dismantled after their death. So it's not just the question of finding this person to educate others to follow on their footsteps, but also it is about the continuation of that system that they create. The reason for the impossibility of making a prescription for the master breed is that it is not a breed at all. To call it so is to change the sense of the word. Breeds are specialized for particular purposes, but the essence of masters is that they must not be specialized. They have to be able to deal with totally unforeseen conditions, and this is a quality of wild, not of tame life. No prescription for the master breed is possible. So, in other words, if you do want to create a master breed that will control the entire universe, they cannot be tamed, because they must have this freedom of mind, uh, the freedom of initiative in order to successfully manage and control the population. So, by its own definition, um, the existence of the master breed or... Um, of the rulers of the world is not feasible. Of all animals, man is the most ready to try experiments. And there are always candidates, far too many candidates who regard themselves as fit members for their master breed. This quality is a characteristic of a wild animal, and it will always prevent man from domesticating himself. He will always prevent the creation of the master breed through which alone the rest of man could be domesticated. The evolution of the human race will not be accomplished in a 10,000 years of tame animals, but in a million years of wild animals. Because man is and will always continue to be a wild animal. Even when Adolf Hitler uh, took a hold of the idea of eugenics and tried to implement it to create a master Aryan race. His larger project was deemed unsuccessful. After just a mere uh, 10 years of existence, he was destroyed uh, by other races that uh, assembled together against him. 
henceforth uh, if certain uh, people try to splinter off from the rest of the humanity to create this master breed it would be impossible for them to sustain themselves long term therefore this goes against the grain of most conspiracy theories that say that there is some kind of a wise body of man outside of your human race that guides and directs our development so there is nothing to worry about just make sure you are uh, remain vigilant in the face of adversity and know that you are the individual and you have the power you are the man or the woman that is capable of achieving great things thank you so much uh, for listening and until next time on the arsenic theory channel thank you